I would first encourage everyone to study the concept of money printing. I would suggest to them that it is a euphemism for stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. Hello, and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and we are talking to some of the leading voices in Bitcoin, their backstories, how they were first introduced to Bitcoin, and their take on what the cryptocurrency offers. I'm so excited to share my next guest is the very thoughtful and brilliant Robert Breedlove. Robert is the founder and CEO of Parallax Digital, a global crypto asset investing consultancy firm. He is a freedom maximalist, a former hedge fund manager, a philosopher, a writer, and podcaster, and he is eager to spread the message that Bitcoin is honest money. If you haven't read his essay on the number zero in Bitcoin, it is a must read. I'll link it in the episode notes. And it's all about how he believes Bitcoin will profoundly shift our world in the same way the discovery of the number zero did. He sees Bitcoin as as a fundamentally humanitarian movement that exposes a rigged system while offering hope for the future through a renewed connection between sound money and society. If you already follow him, you might learn a few new things you didn't know about him. So without further ado, here's Robert. All right. Well, thank you, Robert, so much for doing this. Really excited to chat with you. Um, my first question, I just really want to hear about your background and origin story. So I read that you're from Tennessee. That's right. Yeah, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, I did my undergraduate and graduate degree also in Tennessee. So I have a undergraduate in accounting and finance, also got my master's degree in accounting and finance. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I just knew I wanted to be a businessman. I thought that meant, you know, carrying a briefcase, sending faxes, collecting checks. I didn't really know. Um, and when I got to college, um, I found out that the, the accounting degree was the most challenging degree. So I ended up going that route. And then straight out of school, I was a certified public accountant for a number of years. So I was doing tax strategies for high net worth individuals and investment partnerships, things like that. And then decided that that career path was way too linear for me. It's a very, very predictable career path. So I decided to get a bit more risky and went out on the entrepreneurial path instead. Um, I was mostly a career CFO focused in tech. And then it was around, it was 2014, I started investing personally into crypto assets, but it wasn't until 2016, going into 17, that I really started to see the light, so to speak. Um, but it was actually, it was Ethereum that really drew me in. It was when I found this concept of smart contracts and Nick Zabo had written a lot about them in the late nineties about how they could automate away a lot of the intermediary functions that, that we have in traditional finance today. That's when I became really absorbed in the space. But over time, I like to say I started investing in the space heavily. So just kind of the top market cap weighted crypto assets and where my money went, my mind followed. And through that intellectual journey, you know, down the proverbial Bitcoin rabbit hole, yeah. I've become much more focused on Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is is the biggest innovation we're going to see in our lifetimes, frankly. Yeah, no. And I, I know you've called it the most superior monetary technology that has ever existed. And so I want to talk sure. to you about a little bit of that philosophy. But first, just out of curiosity, I mean, you're such a philosopher. When you, you, when you say you wanted to always be a businessman, I mean, what was it? Why did you want to go into that world? Um, was it something about your upbringing and, that made you interested in finance and markets? Um, you know, I'm not. There's a couple of things. One, I used to play these massive. Uh, this it was actually just one game. This massive online multiplayer game called Diablo II when I was a kid, and you could buy and sell digital items in the game, and then eventually people started selling these items on eBay. Oh, yeah. So something clicked with me when I was really young. I was like, and these things are worth a lot of money at the time, like thousands of dollars per, you know, sword or whatever. It right. Been. Yeah. They had real value. Yeah. And so something really clicked with me like, okay, this digital mm. thing, this digital reality is now touching reality in a very serious way. And, I, you know, I didn't fully grasp it at the time, but I guess the mark that it left was that there was going to be a convergence between you know, the physical real world and this digital world. And I just kind of thought that's the path I wanted to take my, my career, but I didn't really know what that meant necessarily. So um, as far as being a philosopher, I don't know. It's funny that 
all my friends have always made fun of me. Like you can never have, you're not good at small talk. Like you're always trying to have the deep conversation <laughs> or this. And I'm like, I don't know, just something I was born with a bit. Um, and it's, it's just worked well with Bitcoin because we, Bitcoin is such a philosophical yeah. artifact, you know, it causes you to ask these fundamental questions like, like what is money and what is government and right. um, all these things. So I don't know, it, it's been a nice blend for me that I've been able to connect kind of traditional financial world, leveraging my education, this technological background I had as, as a kid growing up as a gamer, and then all these deeper philosophical tenants that Bitcoin brings to the surface for a lot of people. That's so interesting. So who was the first person to introduce you to, I guess, Ethereum? And then when was it that that shift happened for you in terms of saying, no, it's actually Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the future and it is sound money. Yeah. So 2014, I'm buying my first Bitcoin. This is, I actually hadn't heard about Ethereum at this point. I don't actually recall the first time I heard about Bitcoin. I think it was in a conversation with one of my friends and his IT guys. Um, and I, I, whatever, I didn't know much about it at the time. I didn't look into it. I just bought a little bit thinking it was some kind of gambling device. Um, bought a little bit, sold a little bit, made some money, thought I was a genius, ignored it for another couple of years. Um, Ethereum was introduced to me by Ethereum marketing, I think, frankly. Um, I don't completely recall the first time I saw it either, but I just, they had the real sleek logo. And so I started to research what it was and, you know, they, they were um, touting smart contracts as their number one feature. I started to study smart contracts and that's when I just stumbled onto to Zabo's work. And if you've ever read that piece, um, he describes a smart contract as a vending machine. It's kind of like the, the analog smart contract. And then he makes the case that a lot of that, you know, the finance is an intermediary function. It's connecting buyers and sellers. And a lot of the service they provide could be adequately provided, much more adequately provided by software than it, than it could be human. So my, my light bulb moment was, you know, wow, this, this wave of innovation could, in, could disrupt traditional finance as we know it, which in the US is like, I think it's 40% of our economy at this point. So that's when I was like, okay, this is big. This is like internet level stuff. Um, started investing, started studying. And then I guess it's a combination of I had this background studying central banking for a little while, but I, I had this gap where I didn't study Austrian economics. So the light bulb moment for Bitcoin came to me through a combination of the Bitcoin community. And I would also say reading Safedine's book mm. that introduced me to Austrian economics. And I went down that rabbit hole. And once you get into Austrian economics, it like it crystallized the whole picture. Totally. It's like money's the one market that's the most important thing in the world. And it's been consistently corrupted across the entire history of humankind. Well, and you, it gives you such a perspective on the type of education we've all had and mm -hmm, sort of the things right. that we're missing. Um, but it's actually interesting that you mentioned that because one of the things I read about you when I was preparing for this interview is that um, you attended church when you were younger and you were spiritual but mm -hmm. agnostic. And then you had these explorations. You went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and you found yourself reacquainted with both Christianity, but also you were inspired by Austrian economics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it just makes me really curious. Yeah. Um, you really did your homework for this. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. I, <laughs> I, yeah. So I grew up Southern Baptist. I grew up in Tennessee. We attended church. Um, I liked it a lot when I was young, but then as I got into my teenage years, I was reading a lot more about astrophysics and science. So I guess I became much more skeptical slash atheistic. Mm -hmm. And then Later in life, I got into yoga and meditation. So that sort of got me back on a spiritual path, um, but not religious necessarily, still, still agnostic. And then it was actually, you know, it's funny, the Bitcoin rabbit hole, it's got all these, these forks and yeah. um, uh, different paths that it takes you on. But it actually introduced me to Jordan Peterson. And just one of the, the uh, guy I was working with was reading his book and I started hearing about a lot. Jordan Peterson a lot in the Bitcoin community as well. So I started to read his book, watch his lectures. And if you've ever seen his lecture series on the psychological significance of the Bible, it's, it's simply incredible. It's on YouTube. Um, I think they've got like, you know, 5 million views each. It's probably 
30 to 40 hours of content. He's got these back-to-back um, lecture series. And it's just incredible. He he bridges that gap between science and religion and spirituality and psychology and just blends and mythology, blends it all together. So oh, wow. he really, um, I guess, reacquainted me with my religious roots. And now, yeah, I, I've been reading the Bible. Um, there's, there's this connection And this is just an interesting connection for people to think about. But I I kind of think that the market, the free market, which is where we just, I've argued in a lot of my writing that it's this generator of pragmatic truth, that it generates accurate prizes, useful tools, and virtue. Um, And I would say that these pragmatic truths are as close as we can get to the absolute truth, which you could say is represented by God or nature, or universe, or whatever your your term is for it. Um, So I think that in many ways, the free market, it exhibits a lot of these qualities that are traditionally associated with God in the Bible. So I did this interesting exercise where I was reading human action, which is kind of like the Bible of Austrian economics. And if if every time you come across the word market, if you reread the sentence replacing market with God, it reads interestingly. And then you can also do it in the Bible. You could replace God or, or the Lord with market. And I'm not, I'm not arguing that the market is God here, but I think it's one of these things that it might be the, the greatest way human beings can express their divine nature, sure. right? Which, we're, which the free market is that. It's right. just you're courageously co- confronting the chaos of nature, converting it into good and useful order, using your logos, so it is, it's very deeply connected to this ancient idea in Genesis. And it's like naturally uh-huh. democratized where people, the decisions right. are happening naturally. Um, That's I mean, right. It makes me think, you know, because it's capitalism and the free market, it's almost demonized now, right? And a lot of people think that it's actually the reason for, I would say a lot of younger people think it's the reason for um, inequality. I mean, how, how do you think we got to this point where... America was built on the idea of capitalism, and yet so many people, A, they're not educated necessarily about Bitcoin and the potential store of value and savings technology it offers, but they're also, it's almost like this new state mentality of someone else should be making these decisions for me, and free market is bad. It is the source of greed and evil. Yeah, the it's been demonized, right? Um, and it this is another thing I'm arguing in some of my writing lately is that Bitcoin actually enables a new form of socioeconomic organization, which is really um, it's purified capitalism, or you could say it's, it's a anarcho capitalism where it's truly minimized government uh, government, but we've destroyed the terms. The terms have been destroyed by propagandists in the 21st century where we thought, it's U, you know, U.S. capitalism versus Soviet communism, when in fact, they were both statism. They're both two different forms of statism. Um, and both have at their heart an anti-capitalistic institution, which is the central bank. The central bank is not a product of the free market. It is, right. it is built on coercion, deception, violence, et cetera. So I guess the current misconception of free market capitalism is just the result of that. I mean, we've had, you know, the Federal Reserve was established in 1913, uh, 1913, and they've basically been waging this propaganda war on people's perceptions ever since. So we look around in the world today, we see all of this, uh, you know, socioeconomic strife and cancel culture and just a lot of issues right in the world and we think it's oh it's those greedy capitalists um that are taking all the money but it's just it's a flawed understanding of how an economy actually works and it's you know no one talks about central banking people don't understand it people don't comprehend what it is so i've made an effort to try and call it out for what it is you know it's it's Measure number five in, in Marx's manifesto of the Communist Party, it is monetary communism, basically, is another, another way to think about it, versus Bitcoin being monetary capitalism. And I think for the same reasons we saw Soviet Union outcompeted by you know, U.S. capitalism, which was m- more capitalist, but not pure capitalist, we're going to see Bitcoin outcompete all these monetary communist models. 
uh, that we call central banking worldwide. So if you could have, I mean, just a a couple minutes to talk to literally everyone in this country, regardless of what side of the political spectrum they're on, because I don't know, I, I'm, people try to even politicize Bitcoin or the people that support Bitcoin. And it's like at the root of it, in a, in a country that's just been through a pandemic with all of this money printing, the quantitative easing, this really great gap between the rich and poor, what do you want people to most understand about Bitcoin right now for the general public? I would first encourage everyone to study the concept of money printing. I would suggest to them that it is a euphemism for stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. Um, you cannot create wealth by printing money. You can only reallocate the claims on wealth from some and give to others. So this idea of printing money, even the terminology that's being used, we're printing money or quantitative easing, they all sound great. Sounds good. Sounds healthy. You are eviscerating society. You're destroying it from the middle. And this is the, this is the action that always presages civilizational collapse all the way back to ancient Rome. They print too much money. They abuse the monetary standard. The money loses all its meaning. And then society, as you know, it collapses. Um, and I would say that Bitcoin is just, you know, money, we could say, is the greatest tool for freedom we've ever had. It's something that just gives you pure optionality to deal with whatever problems may come up. That is why the temptation to corrupt the monetary system and control it has been so incredibly strong throughout history. And indeed, there's never been a civilization that's resisted it fully. Everyone gives in to corrupting it. We are now deeply, deeply into the corruption of our monetary system. We're 108 years in. Um, 108 years of producing U.S. dollars, 30%. So one out of every three U.S. dollars in existence was produced in the past 12 months. It's insane. The, infl the inflation we're going to see over the next decade is going to be cataclysmic. It's going to be terrible. Um, and if... Through that lens of money being the greatest tool for freedom we've ever had, Bitcoin is the purest expression of money we've ever had. It is, it's perfected all the properties of money. Um, there's nothing coercive or compulsive about it whatsoever. You don't have to adopt it. Ignore it if you want. Ignore it at your own peril. But it's, it's the greatest implementation of this freedom providing technology called money we've ever had. Well, I actually wrote down on one of your quotes that you had um, in your the number zero in Bitcoin, which I find really relevant to this. You said, Bitcoin is punching a hole and creating a vacuum in the market for money. It is killing Keynesian economics, which is the propagandistic power base of the nation state, along with its apparatus of theft, the central bank. That to me kind of it makes me think that there's some sort of clash that's inevitable. And mm -hmm. a government doesn't want to, a government is greedy too. A government doesn't want to relinquish the power that it has. And there are so many people that benefit from its power. So do you see, I mean, obviously we've talked about the demise of civilizations, of societies, Rome fell. I mean, what's the type of clash that could happen? Yeah, I think there will be attempts. There already have been attempts, frankly, to sequester Bitcoin, shut it down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do ultimately see it as sort of like an incentive vortex where for reasons that are a bit complicated to explore, it, it's very decentralized. It can't be, it's, it's optimized for survivability. So you can't neutralize Bitcoin by a unilateral attack. It's designed to resist nation state level attacks, basically. So if you can accept that it's going to survive, uh, the next rational strategy for nation states that are resistant to Bitcoin would be to actually buy some to protect their own interests. Uh, so I think what is going to happen is you'll see the power structures that have prevailed over us in the industrial age, the two main ones of which are the nation state and the central bank, they're going to be dissolved from within. As people start to acquire Bitcoin, this reorients their incentives towards it. All of a sudden, they do want to see it succeed, at least at the margins for their own benefit. And it just sort of dissolves um, this ability of, of nation states to, to dominate populations. Uh, and it, working from the other side is that the more money we print, the more governments overreach with additional taxation, they're essentially creating larger and larger incentives for people to move into Bitcoin. The more inflation 
you create, the more demand you create for inflation resistant money. And there's only one perfectly inflation resistant money and that's Bitcoin. So it's, it's radical, you know, it's disruptive to gold, gold. You could say money is the base layer operating system for humanity. Gold has been the dominant money for 5,000 years. It's disruptive to gold. Therefore, it's disruptive to the central bank. Therefore, it's disruptive to the nation state as a model for human organization. So that, that's this is why it's so hard to understand because it's a really big deal. And we don't necessarily have a, a historical uh, analogy for it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say radical because I see such a dichotomy in the fact that if you do learn about Bitcoin, if you really study it, if you read the the Bitcoin standard, you learn about Austrian economics versus Keynesian economics. There is such a strong argument there that you can't ignore that. To me, it almost sounds simplistic. And, and ultimately, it Bitcoin is. is extremely simple. It's extremely mm -hmm. transparent. It has proven itself to be very <clears throat> secure. So I guess, you know, in a way, philosophically, like why why hasn't it been mass adopted by now? I mean, with the internet, messages spread very quickly. Why why is it still just such a small percentage in terms of who owns it and who even knows about it? You know, there's this there's this reflexivity, I believe, between creator and created. It's like something that uh, Winston Churchill opined on. He said that, I think he was talking about the buildings we make in turn make us or the tools we make in turn make us. So we respond to the incentive structures that we're poured within. And today I would argue a lot of the, the problems we're seeing in the world, again, are, are due to fiat. We have this incentive to be short-term thinking, very divisive. Um, and and gambling, right? It, this has been documented throughout history is that the more inflation starts to ravage a society, the more people just try to stick their money anywhere or take any long shot gamble trying to, to perform because the money is losing its value so quickly. You just want to put it wherever you can. Right. And so I think you see things like, like Dogecoin <laughs> doing well or these NFTs selling for $70 million and all the, like these crazy scams the true speculations, like people want to call Bitcoin a speculation, but those are speculative. That's no right. Underlying yeah. Technology, so right? Bitcoin is almost hidden in plain sight. Right. It's so elegant in its simplicity, yeah. but it takes a very deep first principles understanding of money true. to appreciate what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's surrounded in this sea of scams and, you know, flashy, shiny objects Sure. that I think a lot of, you know, again, people that are poisoned by fiat currency, I would say at least your perceptions, right? You don't, you, I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain unless you've gone through it because I've been there. I was poisoned by fiat a few years ago. I just wanted to party and drink and travel and whatever, but then you get closer and closer to Bitcoin and it starts to change you, change your perception, starts to broaden your time horizon, starts to elevate your morality even. And, um, I think through, when you see it through that process, you start to see that civilization on balance is poisoned by this corrupted money. Yeah. And so I think they're just chasing all these shiny objects, mm -hmm. ignoring the plain, simple, hard truth. But that plain, simple, hard truth just keeps it's kind of what is that quote that uh, a lie can run around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes? Right. Yeah. I think Bitcoin is still putting on its shoes. Greatest pragmatic truth we've ever had but it requires a deep understanding. You got to put in some time and effort. And most people's attention span today is 15 seconds. So yeah, yeah it's like everyone's chasing the quick buck while Bitcoin is just sitting there like expanding. I think of almost Michael Saylor had his analogies to like atmospheres within within a planet if we were in a monetary planet like it's just slowly eating yes. and expanding and growing and and everyone's looking maybe in other directions or chasing the quick profits when really this is just a, it's meant to be a savings technology so that your money is enough right that's right yeah it's a game of accumulation for that reason it's like you just yeah and you'll get there almost everyone gets there by the way people get lost and they'll try to chase these shit coins or gambling devices, <laughs> they'll get burned a little bit. And then you'll learn the hard way and come back to Bitcoin. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the number zero in Bitcoin and where you got kind of really fascinated by that concept and started learning about the importance, the significance of the number zero to society and to our, our history as humankind. And just sort of talk to me about your, your insights from that. Yeah. So the 
impetus for that was trying to answer that question, which is actually very nuanced and difficult. And that what makes Bitcoin difference than all of these other thousands of altcoins? Um, and it's, you know, the, the core of that piece was path dependence, that Bitcoin has this sort of immaculate inception into the world that um, it was released at a time when there was no comparative technology. It grew um, really under the guise of being just written off by most of the world. Everyone thought it was a joke for a long time. And that just gave it this time to grow organically, work out its bugs, expand its mining network, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the other comparison there is it, the unstoppability of it, because it is at the at its base essence, it's just an idea. And when you look at the history of zero, um, there's there's a lot of comparison there. It was resisted ideologically, um, specifically in in Europe, where we had this Aristotelian model of the universe where we thought atoms were the smallest unit of existence. And then the, the universe itself was like a macrocosmic atom. So the, the, it was a finite universe, basically. Zero was heretical to this. Uh, by the way, that was what the church built their power base on, right, was right. that Aristotelian model of the universe. So the, the church was dominant in the world mm -hmm. at that time by saying this is the model of the universe and we are the church and we dominate this entire finite universe. All of a sudden, this zero-based numeral system comes along that's orders of magnitude more efficient for use basically across a number of domains, basically trading mostly. And you couldn't ignore it. It was just practically so useful, nobody could ignore it. But the problem was that it implied infinity. Because one divided yeah. by zero is infinity. Yeah. So it, it blew out the, the foundations of this Aristotelian model of the universe and brought down with it the dominant institution in the world. Um, but ultimately led to things like the Enlightenment and Renaissance. Um, and yeah, the piece goes into that. Yeah. So it's, it's a very interesting exploration. I, I don't know exactly what, what, I don't know. I guess I got kind of a flash of insight about it. Because I was trying to ask, trying to answer the question, like, what's an equivalent? It's an ideological invention at its core, but it's something that couldn't be stopped. So there's the old saying that um, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. So once you release this idea into the world and it catches fire, it, it enters the minds of people that there's really no turning back. So I think there's a, a comparison there between both zero and Bitcoin, um, and then especially how they they relate to disrupting the dominant institutions of their day. Yeah, no, I think it's so fascinating how you say Bitcoin has basically changed society as profoundly as the discovery of number zero. But for people that really, you know, they have to take the time to really read into that and maybe read your post about it, just, you know, could you sum up some of the most significant impacts that would make sense to people about the number zero? Yeah, so if there's a there's a thing at the beginning of the piece where it shows arithmetic and Roman numerals, and then it's, it's exceedingly complicated. Like you can't multiply, divide, add, subtract. It takes up a lot of page space to do very basic calculations. But then if you do the same calculation with a zero-based numeral system, it's very compact, very tight. So it's faster, uh, less page space, and less prone to error. So it, it enabled us to have more efficient accounting systems. Uh, it gave us negative numbers. It gave us later on, it gave us access to the imaginary numbers. Imaginary numbers are key to all electronic and wireless media. So it, it opened up this whole new domain of mathematics. Um, but it, it was really just more useful. It was a more useful numeral system. And numbers and accounting drive most interaction in the world. That's how you know, you think maybe you have your, your circle of people you interact with, but you're really interacting with the entire global economy through numbers, right? Through your bank account, through your, your investment accounts, through the things you buy and sell, the computers and stuff, the, the supply chain that led to your computer has hundreds of thousands of people involved with it. All of that, that relationship is conducted through mathematics. So mathematics is this, this language that is of more fundamental importance than the spoken language in many ways. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just, just leave it at it. It's, it's complicated, but the piece, I think if you read it, it'll, it'll walk you through zero. Even people that already understood Bitcoin said they read the piece and was like, 
holy shit, I didn't know zero was such a big deal. Yeah, but no, it's fast. Really cool. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's worth like really looking into. And as you mentioned, zero also gave us this concept of infinity. I ca it makes me think of Bitcoin because truly we don't know where the price could go, right? Like the potential is infinity. Right. Um, it's, so yeah, what, in theory, it's a call option on all the capital humanity will ever create. So what are the comparable changes that Bitcoin could bring about, you know, in terms of what zero brought about? What are the comparables for what Bitcoin can bring about? Well, the truth is we don't necessarily know. Um, I would say the other connection there between zero and Bitcoin is that another way to think about Bitcoin is the discovery of absolute scarcity. So I argue that's a property of money that will only ever achieve once because money is a single purpose technology, just for just useful for moving value across time and space. It's valued based on the size of its network. So I go through the argument there that in the same way, Bitcoin cash, which forked off of Bitcoin, basically collapsed back into Bitcoin, the value of it collapsed back into Bitcoin. That's the empirical evidence that we have that absolute scarcity is a one-time invention. Another way to, to describe absolute scarcity is as a 0% terminal inflation rate. So it's the first money in history that will actually take inflation to zero. Um, we could say that, that effectively it's already done that because there's the problem with inflation is just it's just is that it is unexpected. It, is, it introduces uncertainty into the monetary system. Mm -hmm. But with Bitcoin, there's 0% unexpected inflation. We know what it will be between now and forever. Um, and in theory, you know, the inflation rate and social cohesion tend to be inversely proportionate. So the extreme example of this would be hyperinflation, where the inflation rate goes above, say, 50% per month. Social cohesion goes to zero effectively because you can't trust the money. And just look at you know Venezuela today. They've got yeah. cash clogging the gutters, clogging the, the streets. The money is meaningless. There's wheelbarrows of cash being used to buy a loaf of bread. And social cooperation and the division of labor falls apart. Right. So in theory, if you could flip that and take inflation down to 0%, we could drive social cohesion to its maximum. Um, and we don't know what that looks like because this is, again, it would disrupt all of these regional monopolies on money we call central banks. It would put the world on a single global standard, um, similar to the way the Hindu Arabic numeral system, which was a zero based numeral system, outcompeted everything else. There was a time when everyone was using their own version of math. Mm -hmm. Now we all use the same math, it's the one universal language. So the great promise of Bitcoin is to become this universal language for money. And, you know, it's, I guess at its deepest essence, it's a bet on human ingenuity um, and a vote against statism and coercion. Like, why, why do we need force? Why do we need political force in the world? Why do we need political authority? It makes no sense. Man, man's born free. And we, we accomplish our greatest feats when we're acting freely. So I think Bitcoin just becomes the tool that allows us to revert back to that essential nature of who we are. It honestly almost sets up the potential for utopia in some ways. Which is a dangerous word. But yeah. But like I the best, could... pursuing the best in human nature, right? If yes. we're free to, if we're, if there is no conflict and we're able to actually preserve the value of our money, I mean, that, that potential, it's almost unreal. You don't, you think of it as utopia because it's so foreign to right. what we know and what we're used to, I think. That's exactly right. No, that's exactly right. The word utopia is dangerous because yeah. a lot of people think communists, you know, yeah, from yeah. each according to their ability to each according to their need sounded utopian sure. and it led to dystopia. So I'm careful with that word, but I do agree that Bitcoin imposes free market principles on the world. And back to what we said at the beginning, like the free market is simple. Once again, simple, hidden in plain sight. Just leave people to their own devices and they will create, they will self-organize into the most optimal socioeconomic structure. All we have to do is focus on the preservation of life, liberty, property. That's it. That's all the government should do. That's all any, um, any imposition should be really just to protect those three things. And Bitcoin gives us a tool that, that reduces the scope of government, I think, down to those three things. So I think it's important to debunk some of the myths around Bitcoin, because obviously there's a lot of messaging that is so against it. 
And one of the questions that I think some people have or that I've heard, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it, is this idea of, okay, I agree that there's absolute scarcity, that checks the box, but why can't someone or a government actor create a new coin that is absolutely scarce with a maximum supply of, let's say, 10 million and essentially compete with Bitcoin and render Bitcoin worthless? They can. They can render or they could create a coin with a fixed supply. But then the question becomes, okay, who gets to decide? Who decided that that's a fixed supply and who gets to make the exception to that rule? Uh, then the next question would be, how would you distribute that money? So here's another way to think about it. Here's, um, so there's a guy named Schmidt. He said, sovereign is he who decides the exception. So if we're playing a game, we're playing a game of Monopoly or whatever, if I have the ability to change the rules whenever I need to, to suit my interest, I am sovereign, you are not. Right. That monetary system and any monetary system a government introduces, they will never relinquish control of the rules. That would defeat the entire purpose. And they could never provably do it, by the way. Again, there's a bit of nuance here, but there's a reason... Bitcoin has proven its decentralization effectively. Yep. Um, that's not something you can just recreate. You can't just flip a switch to create decentralization. Right. There's this path dependence to it. All government monetary systems are structured such that they control the exceptions to the rules. The exceptions being inflation, deauthorization, uh, capital controls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Bitcoin is the only monetary system in history, the only monetary database, if you will, that's exception proof. It does not permit exceptions. It's an absolutely fixed rule set uh, that no one can change. Therefore, it is the most equitable game that has ever existed. Um, so I would, I would say that it's actually not possible for a government to create an absolutely scarce money supply. Now, what there's a nuance here too that has to do with the understanding of the word scarcity. Scarcity is not just supply driven. Scarcity does not mean there's only 10 million of this thing. Scarcity occurs when demand exceeds supply. So the demand for money is going to be rooted in the credibility of those monetary properties, of the rules that govern the monetary network. Interesting. Yeah. There is no conceivable way that a government can gain more credibility than Bitcoin has already established for itself in its 12 year operating history of flawless, equitable functioning. Um, anything a government introduced would necessarily be regarded with skepticism. Yeah. So, I mean, in the last year, we've seen so many fundamental changes, I think, to society spawned by this pandemic and the global, the monetary printing. It seems like it's the excuse that if it's happening everywhere, then we're fine, right? Because everyone's right. printing. Um, yeah. So we're already seeing fundamental changes to society. We see di the central banks discussing digital currencies. We're already moving in a certain direction. But you obviously predict these these bigger fundamental changes as the result of Bitcoin to the core of society, to our relationship with the state, our relationship with each other. Um, can you talk a little bit about that for maybe people that aren't as familiar? Like, where do you see this going, especially just in the near future in terms of Bitcoin? Um, I mean, near future, I would say, let's say over the next 10 to 15 years, sure. I think we have entered the final stages of the current fiat currency implementation. Uh, the, the big difference here is that we've never had a global fiat currency implementation and we've never had central banks devaluing in concert. So everyone's escalating monetary printing. I think I talked about this a bit in my session with Robert Kiyosaki recently, but I think the global money supply is going to increase about 12x, 12 and a half x over the next 10 years. So we're going to go from $100 trillion M2 to $1.25 quadrillion M2, which is $1,250 trillion. Um, in that time, I would expect a lot of national currencies to collapse into the dollar, actually. So weaker currencies will start to collapse into stronger currencies. Uh, I think the dollar and the, and the Chinese yuan will do exceptionally well. And, you know, I would expect Bitcoin to be one of those 
um, most important topics in elections coming up, like in the U.S. Really, it's gonna it's gonna get to become something that you can't ignore, especially when it starts to break through these certain psychological threshold numbers. Um, and it, it gets a little bananas here because you're in, you're inflating so rapidly that what my actual price prediction for 2031 was Bitcoin at 12 and a half million US dollars. But that's only, that would be equivalent today of a million dollars in purchasing power because the dollars yeah. have lost so much value in that time. Yeah, which is so important um, to think about because a couple yeah. decades from now, it could be on paper, however many million, but that means nothing in US that's dollars. That's right, yeah. And if you've ever seen one of those Zimbabwe $100 trillion yes. notes, you'll, you'll know what we mean. <laughs> yes. um, and I, I think that, at this stage, just studying history, inflation, it, it has this law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. So the more you print, the more you create the need, you create more dislocations in the market that were, they don't require more printing, but people mm -hmm. try to address it with more printing. So you have to increase the rate faster and faster and faster. It goes parabolic mm -hmm. until the monetary system collapses. So you have the crack up boom or hyperinflation. Um, I think the U.S. dollar will hyperinflate by 2035. I think fiat currencies globally will collapse by 2035. Um, one wild card here is that China has been accumulating an incredible amount of gold over the past 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. They're launching a digital yuan now. Yep. They will probably make a play for global reserve currency in this time and mm -hmm. just say, hey, we're, we're digital yuan. We're now backed by gold. You know, let the market decide. Um, right. So there's a possibility that digital yuan could flip the U.S. dollar in this time as well, which is scary because right. China's top-down command and control economy, social credit score, all that's very scary. If they gained a yep. footing to roll that out worldwide, yeah, um, I think we'd resist it a lot in the West, clearly. But and um, their lack of transparency. I mean, already our Fed and central bank decisions are not transparent, but even more so right. in terms of China. That's wow. right. Um, so that would be kind of a very dystopian path, but I think all of these events, all of these, all of this turbulence will just highlight the value proposition for Bitcoin. And, you know, I hope to make a call to arms for educators to that very end. Um, there's this quote by HG Wells that really inspired me. He said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. Wow. So I think it's incumbent upon us to just tell people the truth about Bitcoin and where the world is headed and we'll self-organize correctly. You know, I, I, I'm a big proponent, as you'll see in my writing, of this transition into the digital age. Yeah. I think we are digital natives inherit the earth in the 21st century. And uh, all of these all of these power structures that don't feel right or smell right or look right, they're just not going to survive because there's too much transparency. Information moves too fast. The best ideas win. We've, we've, we've accelerated the Darwinism of ideas and I, I'm very bullish on good ideas. Yep. Especially in the digital age. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Um, yeah. So I just want to talk a little bit about property rights because you also think that uh, obviously Bitcoin is going to fundamentally change property rights. So, you know, how does Bitcoin make property inalienable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the first point would be to understand what property is. People mostly think, oh, it's my car, my house, my stocks. But it's actually the socially acknowledged relationship between you and that thing, the house, the car, the stock, um, such that if someone shows up to steal your car, you know, you have recourse to the monopoly on violence. You call the cops and be like, Hey, this guy's violating my property. Please, un you know, unwind <laughs> right. this forced transaction. Um, so that's, that's a key point that property rights historically, especially for all tangible physical things, have always depended on recourse to the courts or the monopoly on violence to protect property rights. That is the original purpose of government, actually. But Bitcoin is the first property right in history that does not depend on that monopoly. In fact, it cannot depend really on that monopoly because it's a metaphysical property right. It's just information. So you can store, you can custody Bitcoin, the private keys that give you access to spend and send that Bitcoin in any information bearing medium. And 
that opens up a whole realm of possibility um, in terms of, you know, multi-signature, that's a whole rabbit hole in and unto itself, but it doesn't depend on violence at all. It just depends on your own ingenuity. And then it cannot be, if it's properly custodied, it cannot be forcibly confiscated mm-hmm. or it cannot be inflated at all, which is a form of forced confiscation, cannot be directly confiscated mm-hmm. if properly custodied. Um, and it's just a, it's a property right that lives kind of everywhere and nowhere. Or yeah. another way to think about it is it's very close to the logos, which is this generative source of sovereignty within all of us is our, our ability to decide our response to any influence we may face. So it really empowers humanity in a deep and profound way to be able to control the most important property right in the world Mm -hmm. in a, it's in pure information. So you can put it anywhere, everywhere, nowhere. It it just gives you this, this sphere of optionality that we've never had before, right? If you're trying to escape the country with gold, clearly that's very hard. You're going to get stopped at the border. Uh, there's all kinds of funny stuff out there. There There's a guy that, uh, got stopped in an airport and had a bunch of gold up his butt, you know? (laughs) So I I tweeted out that Bitcoin fixes this pain in the ass. You know, you can just memorize your private keys and you can cross a border with a billion dollars of Bitcoin on your brain. Um, or you can put it in a, a, a New York times published article. You can encode it into the article such that it's been published everywhere and nowhere. Only you have the key to decipher it. Who's holding your Bitcoin then? Right. It's just living. It's hidden in plain sight. So it changes the game for property rights. Um, And in doing so, reduces the relevance of the monopoly on violence. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about custody and this idea of trust, because I think, you know, right now it's still regarded as so volatile. A lot of people are afraid to put any money in it because they actually trust the banking system, our legacy banking system, which actually has a ton of fraud, whereas yeah. Bitcoin, you know, in in its existence has not shown to be susceptible to fraud. But people have this trust that the money that they're looking at online in their account at Chase or Wells Fargo is somehow real and has intrinsic value as opposed mm. to this like digital cash that is it's amorphous and like, it doesn't really exist. I mean, how do you get people past that hurdle of Bitcoin being something that you can trust when it's based on this kind of trustless system, which enables its power and decentralization? Yeah, I honestly believe clearly it's a generational thing, right? Like younger people that are more familiar with the digital landscape are more apt to believe and understand Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, of course I do everything digitally. Why would my money not be also digital? Um, So there's a, I really think it's time, frankly. Uh, There's this, I forget who made the quote, but he said science advances from funeral to funeral where the people that hold the old paradigm just sort of die off over time. And the people (laughs) that believe in the new paradigm come into power and things change. So I think there's quite a bit of that. Um, You know, money is, people are naturally reticent to want to change their accountant, their banker, their money, you know, it's something you want to be able to trust. You want to be able to put your wealth there and trust it. So whatever has functioned successfully for the longest period of time tends to, that is where trust tends to coalesce. And we're just seeing this, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, it's a 12-year-old technology disrupting really at the base layer a 5,000-year-old technology, which is gold. But in the minds of, you know, people more recently, this is kind of the modern banking system, which is whatever. It's been electronic for 50 years. People have been doing online banking or over-the-phone banking for 50-plus years. Um, That level of trust has a lot of inertia to it. And I don't think it will break down until really we go into the next 10 years of this inflation as there's a reason for the trust to be broken down and that all the money I put in my right whatever savings vehicle is now collapsing. Bitcoin is ascending. Maybe I need to learn about this. Maybe I need to think about this. My kids keep talking about it. You know, they won't shut up about it. So there's a lot of that too. this mm-hmm. 
this upward education from the younger generation to older generations. Um, I think around Thanksgiving tables and Christmas, as Bitcoin continues to persist year over year, um, there's just this effect where you just hear about it so many times, uh, coupled with the money that you've been trusting your whole life is no longer functioning. Right. Uh, that, that will just lead to this tipping point. Uh, but I don't, I don't know, you know, there's, again, education helps, but I think most people need to feel the pain. You know, pain is information and it causes people to put themselves in formation and better formation um, relative to the, the new world. So I think the next 10 or 15 years is going to be a lot of pain. So you'll see a lot of people waking up to the truth of Bitcoin. Well, I want to get your thoughts on something because I think that one of the biggest uncertainties for people out there learning about Bitcoin is whether the technology will survive. Could there be some mm -hmm. black swan event? Um, you know, no other asset when we think about gold, silver, real estate, it doesn't have that kind of existential risk to it. There's no black swan mm -hmm. that could, you know, destroy the existence of zero. Um, but True. so do you think that there is this existential risk and do you believe that it can survive anything? No, nothing can survive anything. Um, I think black swan, which, you know, the definition of a black swan is an unknowable unknown. Everything is at risk of a black swan. You make the great point that zero necessarily is not subject to it, but it kind of is because we don't know, right? What if we right. figure out zero to the power of zero or something? And it just, we have a whole new numeral system. We don't know. Uh, gold is what if we figure out if we crack the code for alchemy or we figure out yeah. how to make synthetic gold in a lab, or we discover, we know how to mine gold on an asteroid. We could quickly compromise its supply and therefore it's, it's monetary property of scarcity. So Bitcoin's no different. Um, besides the fact that you could say maybe it's perceived to be more vulnerable to a black swan, given it's, it's youth, you know, it's only 12 years old. Uh, also given it's digital nature. I think people are skeptical of digital technology mm -hmm. as it is. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't help that we entangle these concepts. We, we hear about all these exchange hacks. Yeah. And when I talk to people that don't understand Bitcoin, they're like, well, can it be hacked? I hear about it getting hacked all the time. And I'm like, those are, they're, they couldn't be more opposite, right? There's this most secure computing network in human history that's never been cracked at all. And then there are these centralized exchanges that get knocked over right. five times a year. Yeah, they conflate the network of Bitcoin as opposed to where they're keeping their Bitcoin in a wallet, right? That's right. That's right. So, yeah, uh, you know, we're all always prone to black swans. So um, you just got to choose your most anti-fragile money. Yeah, but I mean, you obviously believe Bitcoin will survive um, and it has so far. But what do you yeah. think is Bitcoin's biggest obstacle? I mean, the so we said black swan is an unknowable unknown. There are knowable unknowns. Uh, the most significant of which is the nation state response. We haven't seen the overt response yet. We've seen little pockets of, of regulation or threats to ban or attempts to ban or exchange shutdowns and, you know, rumblings of enforcing the travel rule or trying to outlaw hardware wallets, like all these little things. But I don't think it gets very geopolitically relevant until it gets to about five trillion market cap, which could very well be by the end of this year. Could be, could be this cycle, could be the next cycle. Who knows? Um, at that point, there's going to be some attempts and at, at some coordinated nation state level to attack this thing. In my view, that is its biggest challenge or hurdle, as it will truly test the survivability of this, this asset that's wrapped in military grade encryption designed and optimized for survivability, but that engineering optimization will be put to the test. You know, I find something so fascinating and that's that none of us could have predicted the pandemic. That was like a true mm -hmm. black swan in a way. And I think it set up an environment for the perfect value proposition for Bitcoin. And I think it, it did wonders in increasing the awareness 
But yet it's so interesting because when you do look at, you know, let's say you do subscribe to the stock to flow model, the price was already where it was going to be, pandemic or no pandemic. Um, Yet there is this like realization that, oh my gosh, a ton of money is being printed. My money's, I I lost my job. I'm being handed money by the government. I don't know how much this is worth. I don't know how many dollars were actually printed or or in circulation. So um, I'm just kind of curious about that because it makes me think like, where would Bitcoin be if we didn't have the pandemic, would it be in the same place? I mean, the question is impossible to answer. Uh, I'll just say that the model that I had been running off of, which was pre-pandemic, yeah. it's it's 100% ahead of that model. I mean, that's amazing and, to me. Um, yeah. So I, it just, it's, I think a lot of it is being, the price action is being driven by inflation expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, in the digital age, these ideas, people are getting smarter and these ideas can't remain hidden for long. So, and there's enough old timers in the world. This might be, I mentioned there's education going from younger to older. There might also be some education going from older to younger about inflation. Cause we've seen this, this force ravage society multiple times throughout history. So I'm sure there's a lot of old timers that are like, oh, this shit, it's about to inflate a lot. I need to buy some land or gold. Yeah. Guns, ammo, water, whatever they can't print, basically. And so maybe the confluence of those two ideas is like inflation is coming. It's really painful. And then young, you know, younger youngins educating the oldens <laughs> that this is perfect, perfectly inflation resistant money um, will sort of le- le- lead to the inflation expectations translating into a lot of market cap growth for Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because if you're under... 50, you don't really remember, I think, hyperinflation, living through that. And I don't think a lot of investors are trained in investing in a a heavy inflation cycle. Um, So I just want to start to, you know, kind of wrap up. And for some reason, I'm curious going back to some of the things you said about just that, that idea of morality and even the notion of God and how Bitcoin can really, it, it has some parallels with Christianity and sort of achieving the highest versions of ourselves in terms of morality. Mm. So do you find it your purpose to, to let people know about Bitcoin? Like, is there some sort of spiritual journey that you're on where you feel like it's your mission and now your purpose to spread the message of Bitcoin in almost this kind of, you know... Um, disciple way? I don't know. I heard this a long time ago that it, um, the purpose of life was to discover your gift and the meaning of life is to share it with the world. Mm-hmm. So I think the gift in myself that I discovered was an ability to communicate um, by the written and spoken word. And I haven't <laughs> really used that gift before Bitcoin. I, I sort of did in my other job. It was mostly, it's just a very different job, let's mm-hmm. say. I never envisioned myself being a spokesperson for anything, much less yeah. uh, a monetary revolution. <laughs> but a peaceful monetary revolution. <laughs> peaceful, hopefully peaceful monetary revolution. Um, but we will fight if we need to. Um, I think that. I don't know that I, I just consider this to be my life's work. I'll just put it that way. I love that, that I I do believe that central banking is a scourge on humanity. It's as bad as Soviet communism, just focused on the monetary system instead of the broader economy. Um, and I intend to channel the truth as I see it to the best of my ability. Uh, as loud as I can, as far as I can, as wide as I can, in the hope that my fellow humans benefit as a result. So I don't know. It feels some days it feels like a spiritual journey. Some days are really hard. But um but you have the memes. I mean Bitcoin Twitter memes. community is just you gotta live for that. <laughs> yeah. The memes are huge leverage. Um but it's a mission. Yeah, it definitely feels like a mission. You know, it's just, it's just better for people at the end of the day. So yeah, no, and you're doing really great work in this space. And I know a ton of people follow you. They've been curious about you. So I hope to answer some of those questions and, you know, just to kind of end it, I'm just kind of curious, what's something that nobody knows about you? Nobody knows about me. Oh man. Or most people. (laughs) 
I really don't know a good answer to this. I, the, what's coming to mind is just like my sports background. I don't know if I ever talked about that much. Oh, okay, I used to cool. do lo- Olympic style weightlifting. For no years. way. When I was young, I competed internationally. No way. Um, and then I did, I boxed for a couple of years in college. So um, I've been a lifelong nerd, but I also got really into sport for a while. That's so. really cool. Yeah. That's cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, any other you know, final words or takeaways you want to leave us with? No, I thank you so much for preparing for this interview. You did a great job. Oh, well, thanks. Um, this is a lot of fun. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Coin Stories. I'd love to connect with you if you have questions or guest requests, so feel free to get in touch on Twitter at Nat Brunel or Instagram at Natalie Brunel. Take care till next time.